If you've got friends with gardens, are a member of a CSA, or regularly visit farmers markets, you know that summer provides an abundance of fresh local produce. But what if you want something fresh for the table in the off season? Growing off season in cold climates is one of the most stunning developments in growing food locally. Even in climates like those in Maine and Iowa, you can harvest something fresh for your table all winter long using simple technology that extends the season from fall to spring. In this lecture, we'll explore ways to put something fresh on your table all year long. You'll learn about what Elliot Coleman calls gardening on the backside of the calendar. Now, I've read hundreds of books on gardening and farming, and most are, to be honest, a little tedious. But Elliot Coleman's books are a real pleasure to read, and I highly recommend them. My favorite is Four Season Harvest, in which he describes the simple but revolutionary techniques he developed at his farm in Harborside, Maine, for gardening in the off-season, late fall, winter, and early spring. Elliot's book, Four Season Harvest, is woven around an engaging story of a trip through southern France exploring winter vegetable production. He tells how he adapted these techniques to his farm in coastal Maine. During his work as the head of the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, or IFOM, in the late, in the late 1970s, Elliot noticed that places like southern France and northern Italy have a long tradition of eating foods available with the season, even in winter. Now note from the map that southern France is at 45 degrees north latitude, further north than most places in the U.S. and about the latitude of coastal Maine, which is quite surprising. Coastal Maine is where Elliot's farm is located, and in fact, most of Europe is further north than the U.S. Therefore, the good, the good news is most of the U.S. gets more light in the winter than France and northern Italy, and that's good news for winter growing. However, Europe is warmer than the U.S. at equivalent latitudes due to warming by the Gulf Stream. Well, Elliot reasoned that in cold climates, we build structures for people, so why not build structures for plants to offset the colder U.S. climate? Elliot's book tells the story of his development of this idea and his visit to France to observe and adapt long-established techniques for winter gardening there. Coleman also drew heavily on the work of Helen and Scott Nearing, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Helen and Scott next. Helen and Scott Nearing were pioneers in homesteading and self-sufficiency, early leaders in modern sustainable living. He was a PhD economist, she was a concert violinist. They began their experiments in self-sufficient living, social activism, and nonviolence in the 1930s on a derelict farm in Vermont. When development threatened in the 1950s, they continued on the coast of Maine, where in their 70s and 90s, they started over again, making a new set of buildings and gardens. They wrote a series of books about what they learned, including Living the Good Life, which became a handbook for the Back to the Land movement in the 1960s and 1970s. They developed techniques for building construction using local stone, grew much of their own food, and managed a thriving maple sugar business that provided cash income. One of their experiments was to extend the season in simple, unheated greenhouses. They published a book about their experience called Our Sun Heated Greenhouse. They began their experiment by accident. One day in early January, they went to the greenhouse and noticed that a, quote, flourishing, lush, and sizable lettuce plant growing, was growing in the ice-cold building. It had survived, untended, unwatered, through several months of outside freezing. Well, they asked themselves, if this could happen, uncared for and unplanned, could more lettuces and other plants survive under better conditions without artificial heat? They went on to develop techniques that provided them with fresh, green food through 30 winters of freezing and sub-zero weather by the time they wrote the book in 1977. The Nearings have passed on, but you can still visit the Nearing Farm on coastal Maine. It's preserved as the Good Life Center. You can even apply to be a steward, living much as the Nearings did, hosting visitors and tending gardens. The Nearings had discovered one of the great advantages of growing in the off-season, less work. In addition, there is little insect or disease pressure. Low rates of transpiration and high groundwater levels mean little or no watering. In summer, fresh local veggies are readily available from friends with gardens or from farmers markets. In the dead of winter, you really appreciate something green and fresh. With all these advantages, 
You maybe decide to focus on winter gardening and minimize the summer garden. You don't need a fancy greenhouse. I'll show you how to build a simple structure for under $100 that will allow you to harvest all winter long. Elliot Coleman became friends with the Nearings in the 1970s, and the Nearings sold him the land for his farm. He has become a leader in the organic and local agriculture movements and one of the best small farmers in America. This is an early example of an older generation of sustainability pioneers mentoring the next generation, and the next generation continuing to develop the work of the older generation. I had a chance to meet the Nearings in the, uh, while they were still alive in the late 1970s, and this was an influence on my life and career as well. This, this influence continues today with a tradition of young people learning the craft of organic farmers by interning on farms run by experienced growers. Elliot's books have gone on to inspire the renaissance in organic vegetable production by small farmers all over North America. Jean-Martin Fortier, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, is an example of a new generation of organic agriculture inspired by Coleman. He's 35 and he's been farming for 12 years. He's making a good living for himself and his family on less than two acres in southern Quebec province. He grosses $160,000 and puts 40% of it in his pocket. If you are interested in becoming a farmer, check out his excellent book called The Market Gardener. Now let's discuss some of the highlights of Elliot's discoveries. I'm also going to give you some tips from my 13 years of experience with off-season gardening. There are three main factors con to consider in growing in winter. The first is plant selection, second is light, and the third is heat. First, let's take a look at plant selection. You can't grow heat-loving, warm-season crops like tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers with these methods. Elliot and others have identified about 30 plants, mostly hardy greens, that do well in winter production. Here are, the, here are a few of the plants just to give you an idea. Arugula, mosh, lettuces, escarole, leeks, carrots, tatsoi, and beet greens. Some of these may be a little bit unfamiliar, and we'll talk more about these plants and the planting schedules later in this lecture. It's possible to build more complex and expensive solar greenhouses that attempt to extend the season for warm weather crops. One approach to trying to grow warm season crops in the winter is the bio-shelter concept. These greenhouses have insulation on the east, west, and north. Only the south is glazed. They often use compost or animals in the greenhouse to help raise the temperature. They are sunk in the ground because greenhouses that are sunk in the ground can use the stable temperature of the earth to uh, maintain their temperature even on cold nights. Sometimes they are even designed for people to live in them. Check out Anna Eady's book, Silviva, or Daryl Frey's Bioshelter book for more details. There is a farmer that uses these methods in Nebraska that bills himself as Nebraska's largest citrus grower, which not, must not be very hard to um, beat. In the 1980s, uh, Chinese farmers developed an unheated greenhouse that allowed them to grow warm season crops in the winter. These greenhouses now cover thousands of acres in China. Their application in the U.S. is an area of active research, and it's something that I'm interested in. My university is uh, developing so that we can take these uh, cold season uh, techniques and bring them to the next level so that we can have a wider variety of crops uh, grown all season long. These systems have a couple of things in common. They are expensive, and they fight nature rather than working with it. Here's the first solar greenhouse I built in 1978. Here's a much simpler system I built in 1997, but in many ways more sophisticated, that uses the philosophy of working with nature rather than fighting it. Mulch garden techniques establish the bed without digging up the grass. You can see the cardboard poking out from under the wooden frame. Simple hoops, a sheet of plastic over the hoops, and a lightweight row cover over the plants are all it takes to grow year round. In the simple systems I'll be showing you how to build in this lecture, we are not doing battle with the cold of winter as one thinks of doing in a heated greenhouse trying to grow warm weather crops. We're creating a simple protected microclimate, sufficient for the needs of plants that don't mind the cold, hardy plants. In addition to heat, plants require a minimum amount of light for vigorous growth. The good news is that most areas of the U.S. have sufficient hours of daylight in the winter for successful winter growing. Let's take another look at the map comparing the U.S. and Europe. Believe it or not, southern France and the Ligurian coast of Italy are at the same latitude as Elliot Coleman's farm in coastal Maine, 45 degrees north. 
Note from the map that most of the US, again, is further south than Europe. Iowa, where I live, believe it or not, is at the same latitude as southern Spain, 40 degrees. What this means is that most of the US gets more hours of winter sunlight than most of Europe, where there is a tradition of winter growing. Elliott has found that when the number of hours of daylight drops below 10, as it does in Maine from November to early February, plant growth slows considerably. But if you get plants to a harvestable stage before then, you can harvest their leaves. Regrowth will be slow until day length goes above 10 hours, again, early February in Maine. In this case, you're not extending the growing season in the same way you would with a heated greenhouse. What you're doing is really extending the harvest season. I'll never forget my first experience with off-season gardening. My wife and I were running the farm at Abundance Eco Village. We had visited Elliott's farm in Maine, but only in the summer. We invited him to Iowa to give a workshop on four-season growing, and we decided to give it a try. We were confident it could work, but it seemed too good to be true. Could plants really survive in an unheated greenhouse during a harsh Iowa winter? Instead of closing the farm down completely in late fall, we got one greenhouse ready to grow through the winter using the methods we learned from Elliot. It all seemed really counterintuitive. Instead of pulling plants out of the ground, we were planting seedlings. As it got colder, we covered them with row covers, a lightweight fabric that protects plants in winter while letting in light, air, and water. When the first hard freeze came, it looked like our experiment had been a big disaster. Early in the morning, the plants were frozen solid. We wondered what we had done wrong. Imagine our surprise when we came back a few hours later after the sun had warmed the greenhouse and discovered the lush, green, healthy plants ready for harvest. Years later, it still gives me a thrill to see a cold frame of, or greenhouse full of greens in the dead of winter, made possible by some simple protection methods and winter sunlight. In summary, there are two tricks to growing off season. The first is a simple unheated greenhouse or cold frame technology supplemented with floating row covers. This can be done on a wide range of scales, ranging from small backyard structures that cost less than $100 to build to large commercial operations with acres of greenhouse. We do this at my university with our uh, large commercial greenhouse. It's about an acre that feeds our cafeteria. The second uh, uh, factor to consider in winter production is the selection of plants and the timing of planting and harvesting. Let's talk about structures first. Here's one I designed that was built for less than $100. In a few minutes, I'll show you how to build one of these. Here's a two acre greenhouse in my town inspired by Elliot's work. A greenhouse like this can provide a good living for a family or small group of people. I'm part of a CSA that allows me to get a box of veggies in January in Iowa picked that day. Here's a greenhouse that was built uh, by a friend of mine from a frame of an old trampoline for a few hundred dollars. Once the outside gardens have stopped producing, it provides hundreds of salads through the fall, winter, and early spring. Just as we build structures for people in cold climates, we need to build structures for plants. The rule of thumb is that every cover over your plants moves them one USDA zone about 300 miles uh, distance further south. But every cover also blocks light, so there's a trade-off. It turns out for most of the US, two covers are about right. The first cover is plastic or glass, and the second cover is a special lightweight fabric that rests gently on the plants or on supports just above. Floating row cover goes by several brand names. Unlike plastic, floating row covers let in moisture and air and transmit about 90% of the light. In the early stages, you can put the cover directly on the plants. They'll just lift it up as they grow. Once freezing weather starts, it's better to support the row cover over the plants with simple hoops so that the row cover doesn't freeze to the plant. Earlier, I showed you a wide range of structures for off-season growing. Let's build a simple structure to illustrate how to grow in the off-season, using parts you can scrounge or find at your local building supply store. We'll make a 4 by 8 foot mini greenhouse, but you can modify the size to meet the space you have available. Here's a list of materials and tools you need to build the structure. First, to build the frame for the bed, you'll need uh, two boards, 2 by 10 feet, that are 8 feet long. Then you'll need uh, four boards, two by two, that are 10 feet long for the pieces that'll hold the plastic down. 
you'll need a sheet of 10 by 10, four or six mil plastic sheeting. If you have to buy a bigger piece, then you've got a lot extra for future years when you have to replace the plastic, or you can share it with friends. You'll need four pieces of half inch electrical metal conduit, which comes in 10 foot lengths. You'll need 16 two hole straps for the conduit to connect it to your uh, garden frame. And you'll need uh, about 12 two and a half inch screws, about number eight, and 32 one inch screws. For tools, you'll need an electric drill, a wood saw, or you can have the lumber yard cut the boards to length for you. And you'll need a special hoop bender uh, if you're using the half inch electrical conduit for hoops. You'll need a utility knife or scissors for cutting the plastic, and you'll need a tape measure. You'll also need uh, a permanent marker to help you mark out the distances uh, when we'll need to mark out when we bend the tubes. Note that you'll have to buy extra of some items. They come in packs that often have more than you need. You can use the extra by getting your gardening friends together and having a mini greenhouse making party. You'll need hoops to hold the plastic over the plants. We'll attach the hoops to a simple raised bed frame. In a garden, you could put the hoops directly in the ground. Build the frame from two by eight or taller wood. Next, let's build the hoops. You can use a wide variety of materials for hoops. If your garden is in a sheltered spot, you could use stiff wire, about number nine wire is about right. Galvanized wire will resist rusting. You could also use plastic piping or conduit. But in Iowa, where I live, we have strong winds and violent weather, and I've found from hard experience that wire and plastic hoops don't stand up to the harsh Iowa weather. I use half-inch metal electrical conduit, also called EMT. EMT is inexpensive, about $2.50 for a 10-foot length, and it's really easy to get at hardware and building supply stores. I bend the 10-foot lengths of EMT pipe into hoops with a special bender. The bender costs about $40 and could be used to make thousands of hoops. For this example, I'll use four foot wide hoops, but you can also get benders to make three foot wide and six foot wide hoops. Mount the bender on a sturdy table. A picnic table works or a piece of plywood. Here we've used a small uh, workbench. Place a mark 16 inches from each end of the pipe. Place the conduit in the bender and slide up to the 16 inch mark. Then bend until the conduit just reaches the holder at the other end of the bender. Pull the conduit out, flip it around, and slide it into the 16 inch mark on the other end and bend the other end around. And grab both ends and gently squeeze the ends toward each other to complete the bend. It sounds complex, but once you've got the hang of it, it only takes a minute or two to make a bend. It's, it's easier to do than it is to tell you to do. Next, we'll attach the hoops to a frame using the two hole straps and one inch screws. Okay, now let's attach the ends to the mini greenhouse. First, mark and cut the ends out of the plastic. It helps to use one of the hoops as an aid for your marking. Then use special clips or make your own from plastic to attach the tubing to the end of the greenhouse. Put foam pipe insulation over the end greenhouse hoops to protect the plastic. Then finally, we'll put the plastic over the greenhouse. It helps to have two people for this part of the process. Cut a piece of plastic 10 by 10. Lay one edge of the plastic along the wood. Lay the second piece of wood on top. Holding the plastic tight, screw the two pieces of wood together every 12 to 18 inches. And then repeat this for the other side. This holds the plastic down in uh, windy weather. Then place the plastic over the hoops. Now you're, you can see your greenhouse is uh, pretty much done. The weight of the wood will hold the plastic on the hoops. You can roll the plastic up on the hoops to vent the greenhouse on warm days. If you are placing the frame over grass, there is no need to dig up the grass. Simply place an inch or so of compost or manure over the grass, cover with cardboard, and fill the frame with soil or compost. You may, may remember this from our discussion about sheet mulching. It's amazing to see the rest of your garden dying and going to sleep while the winter garden is just getting started. If you've got the room, you can use a similar process to build a greenhouse you can stand up in. You can also buy kits that have all the parts included. Costs can be as low as $1 per square foot from, per, for materials. Now that you know something about structures for off-season gardening, let's look at plants that work well in an off-season garden. First, a review of general principles. 
The idea with these greenhouses is to work with nature, selecting plants that are cold hardy and adapted to growing in the off season. Since there is no heat source, at night it will be almost as cold inside the greenhouse as it is outside. Plants for the winter garden need to be able to withstand freezing. As I mentioned earlier, day length is another important factor. Time your planning so that the plants are at the right maturity before day length drops below 10 hours per day and growth slows. Remember, what you're doing is extending the harvest season more than extending the growing season. Going into detail on the proper timing for all the possible crops you could grow is beyond the scope of this course. Check out Coleman's book, Four Season Harvest, for details. Winter gardening is a solar-driven process. When the sun comes out, the temperature in the structure will quickly rise to the 70s, even on a zero-degree day outside. The amazing thing is that the plants that freeze at night will recover in the warmth of the structure in the next day and can be harvested. But remember, you can only harvest when the plants have thawed. You will be amazed the first time you see dead-looking, frozen plants magically recover when the sun comes out. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to the harvest only when thawed rule. Both mosh and totsoy can be harvested when frozen, solid, and look perfectly normal after they thaw. So can scallions and leeks, and of course, sweet baby carrots, which are hiding in the soil. Spinach and parsley will also recover adequately after being harvested frozen. Most plants are somewhat cold hardy when they are small, so baby lettuces are a good choice. Plants with large fleshy stems, like mature chard, will deteriorate quickly with the freeze-thaw cycles of winter gardening, but baby chard works well. Some plants, like mosh, also known as corn salad, are well suited to winter growing as they are winter annuals and have evolved to complete their life cycle in the off season. Here are some of my favorites in order of cold hardiness and winter dependability. Mosh, though relatively unknown in the US, is a common winter salad green in France and Italy. It is very cold hardy and you can harvest the whole plant, which is a bit like a miniature head of lettuce. It's one of the best suited plants for winter gardening. Coleman recommends the variety Vite. Spinach is very cold hardy. You can cut the leaves and they will grow back. A good variety for winter gardening is space. Many Asian greens, like tatsoi and pak choy, are tolerant of cold weather. Tatsoi can be harvested when frozen. Andive, chicory, and escarole tend to be a bit bitter, but less so in the winter harvest garden. They add complexity of flavor to winter salads and are great wilted. Now, it's hard to get red color in winter greens, but the red tops of bull's blood beets are tender when young and make a great red addition to salad. Starchy vegetables like carrots go through a remarkable transition in cold weather. The starch gets converted to sugars, which act as a kind of antifreeze protection against the cold. Elliot calls his winter carrot harvest candy carrots and claims that children will trade candy bars for his carrots. They're that sweet. Here's a couple of other ideas for food production in the off season. Growing sprouts is another great way to extend the season. You can do it in an apartment and some sprouts don't even need light. Sprouting increases the nutritional value of a seed and makes it more digestible. Here's a couple of simple methods for growing sprouts at home. Tray sprouts, this is like mini farming. You use a smallest amount of soil in a shallow tray. Good candidates include sunflowers and buckwheat. Microgreens, these are baby versions of veggies usually eaten at larger stages of maturity. The method used is similar to tray sprouts, a tray with a little bit of soil. The seed can be expensive, and varieties suitable for growing as microgreens include lettuces and broccoli. Finally, you can grow sprouts in a jar. Home-scale sprouting systems are readily available. Consider perennial vegetables to extend your garden season. There are a wide variety of per perennial vegetables, things that you plant just once that grow back year after year, sometimes for decades. Some, like sorrel and Egyptian walking onions, are the first green things in the garden in spring. A brilliant green potato sorrel soup is one of my favorite early spring meals. And if you keep the sorrel cut back through the year so it doesn't go to seed, you can actually harvest sorrel from early spring until late fall. Asparagus is a common perennial that provides a welcome early harvest in the spring. Here's a greenhouse that uses waste heat from a factory. The waste heat warms the ground in the greenhouse and keeps it above freezing all winter long. The extra heat makes the plants grow faster and you can grow a wider variety of plants. 
The temperature eight feet in the ground is always 55 degrees. This greenhouse uses tubes in the earth to help moderate winter temperatures and to store excess heat from sunny days. I harvested this salad for Thanksgiving dinner from this greenhouse after a frigid eight degree night. This greenhouse is a new feature in my community and it's also used uh, for school children to learn more about growing food and it works really great because the heat allows the greenhouse to have extended production throughout the time when students are in school. Salads that come out of this greenhouse are served in the cafeterias in our local schools in our community. At whatever level you get involved in the winter harvest, you will discover some of the best food and easiest gardening you have ever experienced. Remember, the winter work is mostly harvesting. In the colder parts of the U.S., off-season crops are planted in the second spring of September and October. Furthermore, there are almost no weeds. The pests have all left for warmer climes, and there is no watering because evaporation is low and soil groundwater table is high. As crops are harvested and empty spaces appear in your home greenhouse, sow more seeds whenever the spirit moves you. This gives a wonderful sense of the home garden as an ongoing process or cycle, not the start and stop operation it is for people who garden only in the summer. And you can forget about the fall madness of canning and freezing. And remember, Elliot Coleman developed all this in Maine. Over 85% of the United States is further south than Maine with more sunlight and warmer winter weather. From fall through spring, the amount and variety available from the winter harvest depends on where you live and the severity of your winter weather. Row covers, hardy vegetables, and a succession of fall planting dates is probably all zone nine and 10 gardeners need. In zone seven and eight, a mini greenhouse alone will work, but adding a row cover under the mini greenhouse will be even better. For zone five and six gardeners, the double coverage of inner and outer layers will bring daily harvests that will amaze and delight you. If you live in the frigid mountains of Vermont, for example, in zone three or in far northern areas of the US or in Canada, even the double covered crops may get beat up a bit during the coldest weather, but the veggies will bounce back as the winter recedes. Before I close, I'd like to point out that growing things out of season is not really a new idea. French King Louis XIV's kitchen garden, called the Potager du Roi, was established in 1668. The head gardener, Jean-Baptiste La Quintini, was a master at growing things off season for the Sun King's table. He was able to produce asparagus and lettuce in January, strawberries in March and December, radishes in February and figs in March, all without fossil fuels. In the 1700s, the gardens even produced 700 pineapples and coffee. Well, how did he do it? Well, he used many of the techniques we discussed in this lecture, but he also used the heat given off by composting horse manure, much like Ben Falk's compost heated shower we saw in an earlier lecture. Give off season gardening a try next winter. Start planting during the second spring and enjoy the freshest winter food you've ever eaten.